This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Watch thousands of high-quality documentaries and get access to my streaming service Nebula using the link in the description. It didn't look like any plane that had ever flown before. In fact, it really didn't look like it should have been able to fly at all. But 80 years ago, a new kind of aircraft took to the skies that promised to fly higher, faster, and further. And its visionary designer was convinced that flying wings would transform the way we fly. But in just a few short years, these futuristic flying machines would be gone. Every last one destroyed or broken up for scrap. In 1941, the United States had some of the best bombers in the world, rugged and heavily armed. But loaded with bombs, the furthest they could fly was only about 3,000 kilometers, which wasn't nearly enough, because the United States was about to be drawn into the Second World War. By the spring of 1941, Nazi Germany had conquered much of Europe, and Britain looked like it was next. Without access to Allied airfields in Europe, bombers like the B-17 and B-24 would have no way of reaching Nazi Germany. So the Americans would have to build a new kind of bomber, one that could fly all the way from North America to Europe, strike Nazi targets, and return home. But building the world's first intercontinental bomber would be a daunting engineering challenge. Conventional wisdom suggested that the aircraft would have to be enormous, at least two or three times larger than existing heavy bombers, with massive wings, a bunch of engines, and a huge reserve of fuel. It would also be relatively slow, and its enormous size would make it an easy target. But one pioneering aircraft designer by the name of Jack Northrup proposed a radical alternative. On any plane, the engines, tail surfaces, and fuselage all contribute to drag and structural weight, reducing aircraft performance. What if you could eliminate these elements until you were left with only the wing? The result would be a shape that maximizes lift and minimizes drag. If you could get it to fly, it would make for a much lighter, faster, and more efficient bomber. Northrop's idea wasn't as crazy as it sounds. By 1940, he had successfully flown prototypes, proving that highly efficient flying wing aircraft could handle just as well as conventional ones. And although Northrop wasn't the first to develop flying wings, he was about to take the concept further than anyone else. Northrop promised the Air Force a bomber that would fly nearly a third faster than existing heavy bombers, and higher, making it less vulnerable and the efficient all-wing design would give it the range to fly to Europe while carrying twice the payload. Impressed with the concept, in 1941 the Air Force ordered Northrop and his small team of engineers to develop the new bomber in just two years. To make a round trip all the way to Europe, Northrop's flying wings would have to travel more than 9,000 kilometers, a mission that would keep it airborne for nearly 24 hours. The bomber's crew of nine and six relief crew would have to operate in shifts, working inside a cockpit, equipment bay, and crew cabin housed inside the center section of the wing. Also housed entirely inside the wings were the engines. With 28 cylinders and twin-turbo superchargers, they were the most powerful piston radials ever put into production. Each drove contra-rotating propellers, allowing the bomber to dash to over 600 kilometers an hour. But making a flying wing stable required a complete rethink of control surfaces. Without vertical and horizontal stabilizers, all of the control surfaces would have to be located on the wing with the bomber featuring an entirely new kind of control surface called an elevon. Northrop's low-drag, high-lift flying wing would also pack a punch, with six underwing bomb bays capable of holding up to 10,000 pounds of armament and 20 remotely operated machine guns to fend off enemy fighters. Pound for pound, Northrop's flying wing would outperform any conventional bomber, and the Air Force had plans to build hundreds of them. When the first prototype was unveiled in April 1946, the world was taken aback. No one had ever seen a plane quite like this. 
Designated as the XB-35, the bomber's development had been kept a closely guarded secret. But it never made it into the war. Although it had been approved for development in 1941, progress was delayed by technical issues, a shortage of wartime engineers, and production limitations. And when Britain never fell to Nazi Germany, the Americans conducted bombing campaigns from British airfields, lessening the need for a new intercontinental bomber. These factors all delayed the XP-35. But the Air Force still felt that Northrop's flying wing held tremendous promise and was eager to continue development. By 1946, 13 pre-production YB-35s were already under construction, and with post-war aviation developing at a breakneck speed, the Air Force requested that two prototypes be converted to jet-powered versions to be redesignated as YB-49s. The prop-driven XB-35 made its first flight in June of 1946, followed by the jet-powered YB-49 a year later. Both aircraft were to undergo thorough evaluation by the Air Force. And as they took to the skies, many were convinced that the flying wing's incredible advantages went beyond just military. Fantastic concepts appeared in popular magazines showing enormous flying wing airliners with spacious lounges, dining rooms, and private suites. Even Northrop illustrated how their bomber could become a passenger plane, with bombing equipment cleared out to make way for seats, and the tail cone, once housing machine guns, converted into an observation lounge. According to Northrop, flying wings were the future of air travel, enabling passengers to fly faster, farther, and cheaper, and in comfort that a conventional airliner could never come close to offering. In 1947, the flying wing seemed to be the next evolution in aircraft design. And yet, in just a handful of years, every one of Northrop's revolutionary planes would be destroyed or broken up for scrap. In 1947, Northrop's flying wings looked cutting edge. But delay after delay meant that the design, originally drawn up in 1941, now had to prove itself in the jet age. The XB-35's piston engines were no longer state-of-the-art, and they were so unreliable, nearly every test flight ended early due to overheating, issues with propeller blades, or gearbox failures. After just 19 flights, Northrop abandoned the complex contra-rotating setup for a more simple single-prop design. But this degraded performance to unacceptable levels. And by 1947, it was clear that the jet-powered YB-49 was going to be Northrop's best hope. Retrofitted with eight jets and given trailing edge fins for stability, the aircraft would be faster and more reliable. But the jet engines burned more fuel, cutting the bomber's range down to less than half the original design. Two bomb bays had to be removed just to make way for more fuel tanks, while other parts of the aircraft could never be fully optimized for higher speed flight. Still, Northrop was convinced that its efficient all-wing design would ultimately win out against even the latest generation of jet bombers. On June 4, 1948, the first YB-49 was delivered to the Air Force for evaluation. For Northrop, the delivery should have been a much-needed turning point. But it was just the start of an even worse saga. A day after the delivery, a crew of five Air Force test pilots lifted off on what should have been a routine test flight. Captained by Glenn Edwards, the crew were among the Air Force's finest. But just 40 minutes into their flight, disaster struck. Witnesses reported seeing the jet tumbling out of the sky. The aircraft had broken up into pieces, tragically dooming the crew. Northrop blamed the pilots for pushing the aircraft too hard. But the Air Force pointed to mysterious handling characteristics in high-power stalls. Despite the tragedy, testing continued with the remaining YB-49. But more odd handling characteristics were soon discovered, including a tendency to yaw uncontrollably. Almost imperceptible to the pilots, it was enough to make accurate bombing virtually impossible. Northrop had spent years developing an autopilot to try and counteract the problem. But the aircraft needed something more, a system that could continually adjust and augment the pilot's inputs. In an era well before computers, such a system might have well been magic. 
In March of 1950, disaster struck again when the remaining YB-49's nose wheel collapsed during high-speed taxi tests, destroying the aircraft. By that point, the Air Force had lost interest in Northrop's bombers, because the B-36 had already entered into service, fulfilling the intercontinental role that the XB-35 once promised. The medium-range B-57, a clean-sheet jet bomber also under evaluation, far outperformed the YB-49. And the legendary B-52 was already on the drawing board. These newer generation of bombers could carry atomic bombs, while Northrop's flying wings could only fit smaller weapons from a bygone era. In one last chance for the flying wing, the Air Force had also ordered development of a strategic reconnaissance aircraft based on the YB-49. But the aircraft was already hopelessly outmatched and the program was soon cancelled. Incredibly, Northrop's flying wings were just too out of date, yet in other ways still too far ahead of their time. And soon, all remaining flying wing airframes were broken up and sold for scrap. Devastated, Jack Northrop left his firm in 1952, having never realized his dream of the flying wing. Until he was given a glimpse into the future. In 1980, just a year before he passed away, Northrop was given clearance to see a new secret aircraft under development. An enormous flying wing with the exact same wingspan as his YB-49. The design would make the bomber virtually invisible to radar and would allow it to fly more efficiently, aided by a computerized flight control system that Northrop could have only dreamt about in 1941. With tears in his eyes, Northrop supposedly whispered that he now understood why God kept him alive all these years. The Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit is the world's most advanced aircraft, a bomber that strikes fear into the heart of its adversaries and remains shrouded in secrecy. In a few weeks, I'll be releasing my next Nebula exclusive on the legendary B-2. It'll be my 10th exclusive video on Nebula. And some of you might be wondering, why are these videos only on Nebula? The reality is, it takes weeks to create a mustard video. There's careful research and writing, animations and graphics to make, and rare archival footage to license. To make it all worth it, the videos have to do really well, and that influences which topics I can cover on YouTube. But on Nebula, there's no algorithm, so I can make the videos I want to make and dive into the curious details that a smarter audience appreciates. And it's all possible because tens of thousands of you have already signed up for the Nebula Curiosity Stream deal. For less than $2 a month, you get access to exclusive ad-free content from your favorite creators on Nebula and unlimited access to thousands of high-quality documentaries on Curiosity Stream. A recent Curiosity Stream favorite of mine is Great British Aircraft, a documentary covering legendary British planes like the Spitfire and the Avro Vulcan. Support creators on Nebula and get unlimited access to CuriosityStream for less than $2 a month by going to curiositystream.com mustard and use the promo code mustard when you sign up.